Scripture reading for today will be from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things provoke promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. I hope my microphone on. Last time I spoke to you, I messed up and I didn't turn it on. So I hope everybody had a great holiday. Uh, very, It's an honor for me to be up here and, and speak to you. Uh, be, before I begin, I have a little story I'd like to tell you. It happened to me a long time ago, many Christmases ago, and that was... Uh, uh, we were opening presents on Christmas Day, and my wife had given me a present. She wanted me to open it, and I opened it, and it was this nice blue knit sweater. And, you know, I looked at it, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I have a sweater just exactly like this. And I pulled it up, and, you know, there was a little pull on the sleeve, and I, I said, you know, my sweater has a little pull on the sleeve. And, you know, what had happened was is that she was wrapping presents and folding laundry at the same time on her bed, and she thought that that sweater was something that she had bought from me, so she put it in a box and gave it to me. So <laughs> there's a running joke in our family that if you can't think of a present for uh, one of your family members, just go into their closet and get something they like and wrap it up for them. So... <laughs> The, uh, the passage of Scripture that was read, uh, there's, there's something in here that I look at. And Paul's goal of instructions where he talks about to love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It reminds me of another passage of Scripture found in Proverbs in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 4. And uh, that goes that the words of a man's mouth are deep water but the fountain of wisdom is a babbling brook. And a lot of people don't know that I'm a scuba diver. And I can tell you for sure that when you're in deep water, it is very dangerous, and it's not a very comfortable feeling. Unlike being by a babbling brook, and I always think about being up in the woods and uh, sitting by a little babbling brook, you know, the water going over the rocks, making a little bubbling sound, you know, and it's, and when I think about it enough, it kind of puts me to sleep. Well, let me tell you something. When you're in deep water, you don't sleep. <laughs> you don't want to sleep. Uh, so whenever I think about this passage of scripture, I think about that in the context of, that it was given, where some people have turned aside to vain chattering, and uh, Paul's instruction to Timothy was to teach them a very simplistic thing to do. Three things that they should concentrate on in his instruction. And that is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. What Paul's instruction in this was not supposed to be complicated. It wasn't supposed to be hard to understand. It wasn't for entertainment. It wasn't for gathering money or putting a guilt trip on anybody. It wasn't for gathering supporters to himself, nor to increase the workforce, nor to rail against anybody in opposition. His instruction was very simple. The goals in our life, as we follow Christ, we can make more complicated than it needs to be. I think that this passage of Scripture reminds me of that babbling brook, that we need to, in our lives, we need to step back a little bit and realize that God's word is easy and light to bear. 
And it shouldn't be. Being a Christian shouldn't be a hard thing to do. It should be a very easy thing to do. So what are our goals as we walk through our Christian life or as we want to walk through our Christian life? Ecclesiastics verse 12 and verse 13 says this. It says, uh, fear God and keep his commandments. Well, that's a pretty easy one to do for the most part. Some of us have a hard time doing that all the time. Another one is in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 through 39. It says to love, uh, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. And there's another passage of scripture that says with all your strength, And then the second part of that is to love your neighbor as yourself. I find it hard sometimes to love a neighbor who's not treating me very nicely. And uh, so some of these goals that we have can be very challenging. Uh, How about this one? Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom. So, you know, in today's society, with all the things that we have distracting us, Uh, All the job that we have to do, all the things that pull us this way or that way, sometimes it's very hard to just concentrate and seek first the kingdom. But that should be one of our goals. Uh, How about this one? Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine so that you glorify God. That, that can be kind of hard, too, especially when you're driving in traffic sometimes and somebody cuts you off. Uh, how about this one? John 4 and verse 24, worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we've done a pretty good job here at this congregation doing that, and that's a lofty goal, and we've succeeded in that. But to do that every day of your life when you pray, as you deal with other people, sometimes that cannot be so easy. How about this one? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Be ready with an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that's within you, and do this with reverence and gentleness. And here's another one. This is, the, this is the really the hard one for me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. Please God in all things, and excel, excel still more. That's kind of a hard one for me to excel still more or even to please God in all things. This list can get very extensive and overwhelming, but it shouldn't be. Paul's instruction that he gave us for ourselves should be something that's easy, something that we can do and not a burden that we can't carry with unattainable goals. Love from a pure heart is the first one. Peter says, in chapter 1 and verse 22, seeing you have purified your heart in obedience to the truth. Well, that seems pretty easy. You know, I obey the gospel. I obey what God wants me to do, and I have purified my heart. For sometimes, though, we look into our hearts and we say, it's just not that pure, God. I don't, I don't really think I have a pure heart. And... Uh, as a person that I've told you before, have, I have a very anxious mind, and a lot of times my mind explodes in 30 different directions at the same time. Uh, sometimes and that, can get, that can get tough. You know, when I think about the young people uh, and some of the things that go on in their mind, you know, uh, it's not, Jesus said, it's not what enters into a man that defiles a man, but that that comes out of him. And I think about Peter walking on the water when Jesus was walking across the water and uh, the apostles or disciples at that time saw him. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter, the brave man that he was, full of faith, stepped out onto the water and started walking towards Jesus. That's What defined Peter was his bravery and his faith. But yet, seeing the wind and the waves, he began to sink. He said, Lord, save me. And the Lord reached out and saved him. He said, why did you doubt? A lot of times, when we have in our mind, our mind racing so much and going in so many different directions, 
Sometimes we can think that our heart is not pure, that we're not, we don't have a pure mind. But that's just not true. We, if that was true, we'd have a Hollywood would be filled with murderers and rapists and every other bad thing. But a lot of these writers aren't like that. So it's not the things that you think about. It's the things that come out of your heart, the things that you act upon that define you. There's a, pat, there's a song that, uh, when I was growing up, really, really helped me. Uh, and it said, don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. And sometimes on our young people, I think that it's something that they need to remember, is that when your wheels are driving you crazy, you just need to act on faith and let Christ calm the voices in your head. Love from a pure heart. In John chapter 3 and verse 2 through 3, John says this, Whoever has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, he was talking about the second coming of Christ. He says, if you have this hope in you that Christ is coming again, your heart is purified. And then there's another one, James chapter 4 and verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It seems to me that as a person who wants to believe and wants to follow God, that from these passages of Scripture that I just read, we, it's not a very hard thing. It's not like I have to climb a mountain or swim a shark-infested sea. I just have to take a step, one step, step towards God, and he comes to you. Obey, and God purifies you. It's not a hard thing. It's an easy thing to do. As for the love and drawing near, our course is this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4 through 6. Let me read that. 1 John chapter 2, 4 through 6, he says, the one, I, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But he who keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to also walk in the manner in which he walked. Seems like a pretty easy thing that if we obey the gospel, if we walk in the way that Jesus would want us to walk, that he purifies our heart and gives us God's love in our heart. It happens for us. It's nothing that we necessarily have to do. God does that for us through his word. Look at John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 through 18. He says this, uh, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life. We know that love, we, we know, excuse me, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. We know that we have that love in us. John chapter, uh, excuse me, John chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might, have, that we might live through him. And then let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 4 and 16 and 17. Uh, and we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, for God abides in him. By this love is perfected within us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. And then let's look in uh, 1 John chapter 4 and 19. We love because he first loved us. Seems like a very easy thing. And then John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And that goes back to my first point that I brought up about the commandments or our goals in God should be something that's easy. And they are easy because God has done them all for us. God has given us the love through the word in Christ into us if we obey the gospel. It's that easy.
A good conscience is the second one, clear conscience. How do we who are sinners, or we who sin, profess to have a clear conscience? There are several things that we can do. Number one is that we pray. Jesus said to his followers and taught them how to pray, forgive one another. He asked God, forgive one another or forgive those who sin against us as we forgive them. And others also will pray for you, asking God to forgive you. Repenting of our sins, when we repent of our sins, it says in John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, that God is faithful to forgive. You remember the Pharisee and the sinner in Luke chapter 18 and verse 10 through 14, where the Pharisee came in and was in the temple praying, and he said, Thank you, God, that I'm not like this man, for I fast twice daily, and I give my alms to the poor, and I do this and do that. But the sinner, he wouldn't even look up, but he pounded his chest and he said, forgive me, God, a sinner. Well, that man went to his home justified, but the Pharisee didn't. To understand that we are free from sin and free from a guilt trip, we don't live for sin anymore, but the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every stain, from every sin. You know, Sean preached about this, is that, God comes in, and he cleanses us from that sin. But we as people, we want to remember our sin. I know I do, and those are the ghosts that haunt me most time when I think about that. But God has cast my sin far away from me. He doesn't remember it anymore. And so if you still think you have sin in your heart, and you don't have that clean conscience, when you get before God and you stand before him in judgment, you can argue with him about it, but I'm not going to, so... And if he does, if you do argue with him, he's probably going to bring up these passages of Scripture to you. A sincere faith. When I was uh, taught what the word of sincere meant, I was told that it meant a pot that was, uh, you'd go to the market back then and you'd buy a pot. And when, what would happen is the pot would have a crack in it, so they'd put wax in it and fix the pot. And so that was, a sincere pot was one that didn't have cracks filled with wax. I've come to find out that a sincere faith is one that where you don't listen to crack pots trying to tell you what you should do. Uh, the cra- uh, sincere means uh, guileless, uh, genuine, and true. And uh, I, I think of an example of a sincere faith. I, uh, this friend of mine, when I was growing up, he had this... Uh, uh, fastback Mustang, and I think it was a 69 or something like that. Nice car, red. Anyway, he got in a little bit of a fender bender on the back quarter panel, and uh, so it was kind of smashed in. And so instead of taking it to a body shop to get it fixed, he decided he was going to take some Bondo, which is basically putty, if you, haven't, if, if you don't know the vernacular. So it's basically taking some putty, and putting it over that, and he formed the fender with putty. And uh, so, and then he painted over it, and of course, sold the car right away. So uh, the first person that drove it and drove over a bump, of course, the Bondo would fall off, and you know. So I think about that in a sincere faith, you know. The one thing that we would want to have, we're going down through our Christian life, down the road of life, is going over a bump or through a pothole and have part of our faith fall off. So that's not what we want. We want a sincere faith. We want a faith that uh, doesn't have any bondo on it, that's genuine and true, that's cherry, like that car should have been. Faith is a belief in God, a trust in God. Uh, And it's different than just kind of mental assent. I I think about children and uh, reading instructions from their parents on how they should act and them saying, well, uh, I believe my parents exist because I read their instructions. That's not what it means. It means that they believe that their parents are right. And same thing when Abraham believed God. It wasn't that he believed that God existed. He believed what God said, and he did what God said. That was part of a sincere faith. 
uh, Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And again, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. When I read about things like this, it's just the same thing as I think about with love from a pure heart or a clear conscience. And that is that God does it. There's a lot of things that God does for us. And all we have to do, like I said, is just take that first step towards God, that first step in obedience, and God does a lot for us. It's easy. It's light. We don't have to struggle with it. They're not uh, unattainable goals. Having love and a pure heart and a clear conscience. And the other things that we do, seek ye first the kingdom, love your neighbor as yourself, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. Those things become easy for us because God has gone the distance for us. He's put this in our heart through his word, and it helps us, doesn't it? A lot of people living in the world don't think like that. They think it's very hard, and that's where the crackpots come in. They think it's very hard to live a godly life. Would it become so easy if you just follow what God said? The faith is also a system of a doctrine of our discipline. Paul said in uh, Acts chapter 24 and 24 that the faith could be heard. He also said that in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23 that it can be preached. And in Acts 7 verse, uh, excuse me, Acts 6 and verse 7, he says it can be obeyed. Our faith is found in the gospel. And that's the only place it can be found. It's not found in some man. It's not found anywhere else. It's only found in the gospel. And if we follow the gospel and the instructions of the Jesus and the apostles, we can obtain the salvation that God would want us to have. And it's not hard. We can attain, we can attain our goals. Our goals of being godly, our goals of being pure, our goals of following God and excelling still more, those things become something that's easy. And if we don't, somehow we fall off our goal, well, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. God has done all, that thing, all those things for us. I don't know where you stand today. I don't know where you are in your faith. I don't know if perhaps... You've let your goals go. One of the things that happens so many times with, with Christians is that uh, it gets hard for them to, to, go, to go on. Uh, other things in life pull them, pull them in different directions. I don't know if you've ever read the, the book, uh, I forget the name of it, is uh, uh, something in a shovel. I can't remember what it is. It was a, written by a man, and he'd written about a faith. But then there was another when the shovel breaks, and he talks about how he fell away, but came back. A lot of times uh, when we put more on ourselves than we should, kind of like when we were reading that passage of Scripture with this, with this uh, in 1 Timothy, there's a lot of people who want to put more on their faith than they need to put on their faith, and it becomes very hard for them, and they can't keep up. And what we need to do is realize that it's not hard that we can keep up. And all we have to do is turn back to Christ, turn back and let God bring us back into the boat, as it were. And he will. He will help us. Sometimes out in the world, people who haven't named Christ before think that they're to never, ever, ever be good enough. It's kind of like uh, people get married. Well, I'm not ready for marriage. I need to get re ready for marriage. I need to have all the wealth and all the house. and I need to have the cars and everything prepared. Or like having a kid, I need to have all this stuff put into place before I have any children. And you never get married and you never have children. It's the same thing. You can't be good enough ever to be saved. It's the grace of God that gives us that. And God gives us all the things that we need to attain our goals that we would have lofty as they may be, in securing our faith and being with him one day in heaven. Thank you for your attention. And if you have a need, once you come, as together we stand and sing.